international uh, cooperation. It should be mentioned at the very beginning that uh, this project became possible with uh, the huge effort from uh, our colleagues at the Center for European Studies at the Middle East uh, Technical University in Ankara. And I would like to issue special thanks to the team of METU and especially to our colleague, Dr. Asha Kalpan, chief coordinator of the project. And I would like to thank her for giving all of us the chance uh, to be part of this wonderful initiative. As you have already seen from our workshop agenda, the uh, workshop itself will last for two days. We will have, we will have two parallel sessions. Uh, and I hope that uh, during the sessions we will, uh, we will listen to interesting and very fruitful uh, um, academically interesting and provoking, thought-provoking presentations. But before we proceed to the actual panels, uh, we will have the possibility and the chance to uh, listen to the lecture by uh, Professor Thomas Diaz, who, who is a professor at the University of Gutenberg well-known scholar of international politics and uh, uh, political science. And I would like to use this opportunity and thank Professor Diaz for his kindness to contribute to our uh, workshop. And finally, before I give word to uh, our colleague from uh, um, METU, uh, Dr. Basha Kalpan, I would like to thank all of you participants of the workshop for attending uh, this really interesting uh, uh, conference and workshop. I would like to once again thank our collaborators from our partner countries for their contribution to this uh, workshop. I hope that these two days will be truly memorable um, intellectual activity for each of you. So now I I'd like to give words to uh, Bashak Alpan. Please, Bashak. Yeah, thank you, Georgi. I mean, um... It's my pleasure to welcome you all to our second workshop of our uh, LEAP network linking to Europe at the periphery. Uh, dear colleagues, students, uh, Thomas, <laughs> all of you, thank you very much for being here. I mean, the plan was different, of course. The plan was uh, to meet in beautiful uh, Tbilisi, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, we are all going through a very uh, hard process anyway, but uh, we are still here together and we are looking forward to hearing uh, about the everydayness of Europe. I mean, when we were uh, planning this, um, this project, uh, we thought about three different axes that Georgi earlier mentioned we, uh, last year. Well, not last year. Uh, well, in yeah, September 2020, we did our first uh, workshop organized by, uh, by our LIVIV team. So it was mainly focusing on uh, teaching and learning Europe. And now we are here um, to, uh, to talk about the experiencing bits, uh, uh, experiencing a Europe uh, dimension of our project. And of course, no one uh, but uh, Professor uh, Thomas Dietz uh, can give a better picture to us about those ambiguities of Europe. Uh, Thomas is a good friend. At the same time, my, uh, my uh, previous uh, PhD supervisor, so I owe him a lot. So I'm really thankful um, uh, that he, he's here today with us. And uh, without further ado, because I'm the only one standing between uh, you and Thomas now, so I'm now stopping now. And uh, I wish you a very uh, fruitful and enjoyable two days. Uh, I'm sure we will learn a lot. We will uh, exchange a lot. So thanks very much for giving your valuable time because I know that it's very hard to look at those boxes all the time. We are all Zoom fatigue <laughs> and now, but uh, without further ado, I'm just stopping here and giving the floor to uh, Thomas Dietz. Thank you very much, uh, Bashak. At this moment, of course, a round of applause would have normally come. Um, yeah. Can you all hear me? Uh, the sound <laughs> is okay? Yes? Uh, excellent. Um, well, thank you for this kind invitation. Um, good to see you. Uh, good to see you again, Bashak. Um, and of course, I would have much preferred to see you in person in beautiful Tbilisi um, and uh, sampled the Georgian food and wine and uh, had, a, had a good night out. Um, uh, alas, it's not going to happen. I was in Tbilisi two years ago uh, and uh, actually at Ilya State University. We did a, a workshop there. 
um, and I have uh, very fond memories. Um, I've also seen some of the advertisements that uh, that you posted in various uh, forums. Uh, there is no way that any human being can live up to these expectations that you have raised, um, and uh, certainly not me. Uh, and certainly these not. These are the expectations raised by the students in Bucharest. So yeah. apparently, you are the best person to speak here. So and, it's not uh, me. And, <laughs> and certainly, I, uh, I'm not sure I can talk a lot about uh, experiencing the everyday in the periphery. Um, so uh, I hope you will forgive me if uh, uh, I will um, do something slightly different. And uh, but I think though maybe you may be able to connect uh, to your theme. Um, and what I would like to do is uh, to reflect uh, a little bit on some of the themes that I've been working on over the years, which I think speak to some of the aspects. And uh, this may not all come together nicely in the end, we'll see, but I hope it, give, it gives us um, some food for thought. Now, I'm going to try and, uh, and let me, hang on, I need some, to do something else uh, first. Uh, sorry, see, I'm, I'm poorly prepared now. Uh, despite all the uh, zooming, um, we're still having issues. So now, um, So I need to get out. Okay, this is the, has someone got an advertisement or something that you can uh, do? Right, now here we go. Now you should see my screen. Uh, in other words, my PowerPoint. Um, you also note that I've done a slight amendment, you know, that, that normally we would soon all be going to the International Studies Association conference and uh, then people would be at the conference and that the normal thing to say at the beginning of the presentation would be, oh, look, I've changed the title of my paper. Uh, uh, I haven't really changed the title of my paper. I've, I've changed one word though, and uh, I changed social orders for governmental orders uh, because I thought that would be uh, fitting better um, what I will uh, capture uh, in parts of my, of my talk. I wanna talk a, about the ambiguities of uh, Europe or rather of the European Union and of European integration. I think that has to do with experiencing uh, Europe, uh, but it also has to do, and I want to link this with a broader um, structural uh, ambiguity in the international society and I want to link this to some consequences this may have in our engagement uh, with Europe and European integration. Um, and uh, I just want to alert you to the, um, you can also see that, uh, can you see the cursor now? That I'm, yes, thank you. Um, so that's very good. Um, so you can see that th I, liked, I like this map. I found this map this morning when I tried to find some nice pictures for you. Uh, this is a map of the 1920s, I believe, of, of Europe 1920s. And I think it tells us a lot about ambiguities. Um, uh, for one thing, of course, you see this is a map of Europe, but at the same time you see uh, the individual territorial states uh, colored differently. This is something we will get back to. Uh, you also see the attempt to draw a line that separates Asia from Europe. Um, and you can see how the line goes well down here, but then somehow it becomes rather difficult to check you know, where exactly Europe is and where not. Uh, and of course, we know how these lines have been drawn over the centuries in different ways. Uh, we also see that uh, parts of what we would consider Africa, are uh, Europe, uh, belonging to, to Spain. Um, uh, so, so there's a lot of you know, things going on here in this, in this map, which I find uh, very interesting. Um, some of these things are still um, present, I think, uh, in some of the regions that uh, you're coming from uh, today. Um, I want to first take you uh, to a place that I've been working on, um, and uh, which is also full of these ambiguities. Uh, this is Cyprus. Uh, this is not the kind of nice beach pictures of Cyprus that you're normally used to. Uh, these are pictures I took in several um, stud study visits with students. Uh, and these are all pictures of the buffer zone um, from various angles 
uh, and in various lines. You can see on the upper left, you can see a derelict building in the buffer zone as you walk from one side to the other uh, via Letra Palace, where the negotiations used to take place. Um, you can see Varosha uh, on the upper right hand side, um, uh, occupied by the Turkish army in 1974. And uh, as you may have heard, these days become increasingly uh, a politically contested uh, area. The issue is about reopening this area. You can see uh, um, a, a, an old plane that was uh, destroyed in the, in the 1974 war. Um, uh, and they used this plane then later to refurbish the other planes that were also uh, being uh, left over uh, at Nicosia Airport, which is of course no longer in use and is now with the buffer zone. Um, I'll, I'll spare you the details, but the point of these pictures is that uh, if, you, if you ever come to Cyprus and you are in the buffer zone, then you experience a lot of ambiguities. Um, one ambiguity is that this is a border and it's a not a border. Uh, this is um, uh, a part of um, Europe, uh, a part even of the EU, yet there is a border there that, uh, you know, you show passports and things um, as you walk across. Um, this is Europe and at the same time the border of Europe. In fact, the Green Line some consider is uh, the border of Europe. In fact, when we come to governmental orders, one of the interesting things about the Green Line is that even though from a European Commission point of view, this is not a border, the rules, say, of Schengen have made it very much into a border. Um, and, and so you, you, you get a lot of very interesting senses of the ambiguities of Europe if you take a trip to Cyprus. And you see that Cyprus is a member of the European Union, but the ACQUI, the legal framework of the European Union is only applied to the southern part. That European integration is about overcoming borders. But ironically, EU membership has normalized this Cypriot non-border as a border because it's a control point for the entry of goods, people. Um, so even though um, the Greek Cypriots and uh, indeed uh, the European Union doesn't recognize the border, uh, the policies of uh, the European Union have in fact made this border uh, a border, if you will. Um, and so this is another, another uh, clear ambiguity here. Um, this normalization of the border um, has both enabled exchange, because of course it was only when Dengtas opened the border that people could move from one side to the other, other than non-Turkish tourists that came to the south who could also previously enter and then had to be back by five o'clock. Um, now they can uh, go back and forth. So on one level, this normalization of the border has increased exchange. Um, and at the same time, though, is reinforced, one could arguably say, partition. Um, there are ambiguities in the sense that Turkish Cypriots are EU citizens. You can go and take an Erasmus year, etc., for instance. But at the same time, Turkish is not yet an official language of the EU. And the significance of this, I think, becomes very obvious when you see that Gaelic is uh, uh, an official language of the EU. Um, where you can argue that this is perhaps even more rarely spoken uh, in EU territory than, than, than Turkish is. Now, a lot of these experiences, these contradictions, um, are of course unique to Cyprus. Oh, so I'm, 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 I'm very clear about this. But I think others are not. And I think there is a deeper sense in which this leads us to reflect on some of these deeper ambiguities of Europe and the European Union uh, in particular. Now, if we look at those ambiguities, um, uh, there are some that I think are pretty obvious and uh, well known. Uh, one thing that has confounded scholars for a long time is that uh, this European Union has a state-like identity. 
um, I was about to say shape, um, and, and uh, this is, would be very interesting to discuss um, and, and how this shape has come about. But at the same time, it is not a state. Um, in fact, the whole idea of European integration was, in my books anyway, to overcome the nation state. This is a project, to my mind, that has its roots in the course of the first half of the 20th century and the two world wars, and specifically, of course, the experience of World War II, when um, the, the, the nationalism uh, turning into fascism and Nazism in the 1930s has led to another devastating war. And um, uh, there were a lot of um, uh, people in, in resistance, etc., that were dreaming of overcoming these divisions of nationalism and creating something new, something that would, a political order that would exceed those, this national, nationalist thinking, this thinking in nation states. And at the same time, people have found, and I'm citing Alan Milward here in his famous work, on the rescue of the nation state. People have founded European integration after the, um, uh, after the uh, uh, Second World War then actually rescued the nation state, allowed uh, European nation states to prosper, to gain in welfare, uh, etc. I'm seeing there are people using the chat. I'm not sure if this is, uh, or something is wrong with my voice. Is this in general a sense that something is wrong with my voice? Can someone say something? Yes, Thomas, uh, there is a weird noise coming from your microphone or, e or your papers. I'm not sure. I mean, it's like, do you have any papers around or maybe when so you... Maybe, is it, is it better now? Yeah, definitely. Okay, thank you very don't much. Know. Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I realized that there was going on, uh, there's something was going on in the chat, but I couldn't quite open the chat without stopping now. So, so sorry about yeah, this. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, uh, I had the microphone hanging down and it was uh, um, dropping against my shirt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if it's better now, thank you very much. I hope, I hope you could still nonetheless understand me. And, uh, very, very well. All right. Where was I? I was about, uh, uh, ah, this was about rescuing uh, the nation state um, and overcoming it. Um, so what we see is also uh, the idea then th that integration is a transformation of borders. So if you want to get beyond the state and want to um, get beyond nationalism, transcend the nation state, uh, the idea was, of course, that you have to, to change the idea that we think about politics in those territorial confines of the, 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 the territorial borders. Uh, and, and integration was very much about that. It was about transcending borders. Um, and even you know, today, we still have a lot of, even on the external borders of the European Union, we have a lot of cross-border projects. Uh, that are being funded out of that spirit right? that, that to, to minimize the impact of borders and perhaps to completely overcome or at least reinterpret what borders actually are. And at the same time, we see the hardening uh, of borders. Um, we see that borders becoming, are becoming more important again on the um, outside of the EU and some would even say on the inside of the EU, huh? even Frank Schimmelfellig. Uh, these days is talking about rebordering uh, Europe and trying to figure out why this is the case. Another ambiguity is, of course, that the EU now is, uh, since Lisbon, a has a legal personality. Uh, so this one actor problem that has confounded analysts of EU foreign policy for a long time. Yet at the same time, you have 27 and I say plus actors because of course you've got on the EU level you've got again a whole range of actors that act on behalf of the of the EU and so you've got if you want to summarize this in a sense you've got this idea that the EU constitutes as John Ruggie has once called it a postmodern polity a sort of deterritorialized polity a polity in Edley Bull's words, that would be something like a neo-medieval kind of polity where those clear territorial boundaries no longer hold. And at the same time, what Stefan Borg and I once called sort of a territorial angst, 
um, a fear of getting, you know, losing the territorial uh, in our systems of governance and in the constitution of our identities. And I think that these ambiguities show themselves in the articulation of identities, borders and orders. And I take that from the work of Matthias Albert, David Jacobson and Josef Lapid, um, who wrote this nice book about uh, uh, identities, borders and orders as three constitutive elements in our modern political thinking that are closely related to each other. So the sense that identities are created by borders um, and also then sustain borders and uh, in their demand for uh, those demarcations. Um, and where orders built on those identities and, and uh, are also constituted by those borders because those uh, governmental orders uh, develop within particular territories. And then again, the administrative spaces that arise from this then uh, reproduce those borders that create them. So identities, borders and orders in that work is, are very much tied together and, and interlinked. And I want to argue that if we're looking for ambiguities of Europe, we see them in those three elements and those ambiguities of those individual elements are linked to the ambiguities of uh, the others and that we experience them uh, these uh, ambiguities um, through our experiences of identity, of borders, and of governmental orders. So I want to try to develop the argument that these, these experiences of Europe or rather European integration in those three elements are characterized by tensions and inconsistencies that relate to fundamental and irresolvable ambiguities of EU European international society. And that while these ambiguities are irresolvable, and I would argue that therefore we must recognize and also accept them. And I think part of why I'm interested in these matters is that very often we actually neglect or even deny them, not deny their existence or think they can be overcome. Um, I think at the heart, these tensions, these ambiguities are irresolvable. But I think nonetheless, the politics of European integration is ultimately about struggles to push EU governance within and while recognizing the ambiguities in a particular, what I would call solidarist direction. So let me talk about a little bit more about experiences of Europe. This is a, a nice picture that I found uh, of the German-Danish border. Um, and uh, you can see, you know, was some of the ambiguities there again. It's a non-border huh, because you simply pass through. Um, at the same time, it is a border. And we know, of course, now with the COVID experience that uh, these borders can very quickly be reenacted again. And, and so let, let us talk a little bit about experiences of these ambiguities and identities in borders and in governmental orders. Now on identities first, um, it's an old insight that I think most people will immediately share that European identity is not something distinct from the national or various other identities that individuals have. That European identity is always multiple identities so that you know, people are not simply European, but they're European and German, and they come from Tübingen or whatever. Um, Thomas Risse once called this the marble cake of European integration, which I think, uh, of European identity, which I think is a little bit of a, of a problematic uh, metaphor, because the marble cake has only two colors, at, at least the marble cakes that I know, has two colors, and, uh, uh, and, and they are sort of intertwined, but at the same time separated. And I'm not quite sure whether the European marble cake has only two colors and whether it's so easy to separate them. But it just demonstrates that, you know, this thinking about European identity is pretty widespread, uh, that, that, you know, it's not like an either or, and that this idea is that people would move from being German or British or whatever to a European identity was evidently uh, too naive. 
Um, and this multiply, these multiple identities are, of course, represented in many different ways uh, in uh, the EU uh, symbolic practice. You have an EU passport that, uh, that not only has the same color all over Europe, but different the symbols of different member states, uh, the use of different flags so that when uh, the heads of government speak, they would normally have a European flag and they would have a national flag. And if you go to the, the local level, there would also be a regional flag or a municipal flag or whatever. Uh, the Euro coins have this, you know, so they look the same, but at the same time, the symbols uh, are of course different and people uh, make fun collecting um, uh, Euro coins from, from all over uh, the Eurozone. But at the same time, I think this multiplicity goes even deeper than is often realized. Because what is the, the, the symbolic image that, you, that is transported in all of these metaphors, in on all of these symbols, is that there is a distinct European level and a distinct national level. But as a matter of fact, I think even what the European level is, is very different depending on from where you look at this. So there is a multiplicity, if you will, in the European as well. So the first thing is to say that the multiplicity of these European identities goes deeper than, than many people would perhaps initially think. And the, the other thing to say is that despite this multiplicity, we continue to reproduce unified identities. So we are fully aware of multiple identities. And at the same time, and this is the ambiguity, uh, we talk about these things as if they were separate and uh, sort of unified identities. So we talk about normative power Europe, for instance, as if there was a unified, agreed upon set of values that everyone would share in the same way. We talk about, say, in, in the context of Brexit, there was often to talk about pro and anti-European, as if that that is European is very much uh, fixed. Or we talk about Europe versus the nation states, as in, so, okay, if, say, Britain does not uh, uh, support European integration anymore and wants to do an exit, then clearly Europeanization must have failed. Uh, and it's a bit ironic that Chris Bickerton once wrote a very nice book about, you know, how member state identities within the European Union uh, actually become exactly that. They become member state identities, whereas previously they were nation state identities and that there's a shift in what it means to be a member state and uh, the identity. And the irony is, of course, that uh, Chris Bickerton later became uh, um, uh, or spoke up in favor of Brexit, which uh, the rest of us um, have, of course, uh, not forgiven him. Uh, but uh, still this idea, I think, is a very good one. So on the identity level, already we can see a lot of these ambiguities uh, coming about. The same about borders, and we've already had some examples when I was talking, for instance, about uh, the, 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 the Cypriot experience. And I've already said that, you know, borders and identities are, of course, closely related to each other. Uh, but you have this deep ambiguity between the internal disbanding of borders within the Schengen area and the intensification of outer borders. In fact, you've got uh, a further ambiguity, of course, in the fact that the Schengen borders are not identical with uh, the EU borders. You've got um, uh, the, the ambiguous practices of introducing border checks at those borders that are no longer borders. For instance, if you fly in from uh, Greece, we wish of course that we would all fly in from somewhere these days, but if you, if you uh, flew in from Greece a while ago, um, then you would be checked all of a sudden, uh, you know, because, you know, all of a sudden, because of the fear of migrants, uh, the, the, the border was, as it were, even though it no longer existed um, <laughs> in, in many ways, it became reenacted. Um, you drive across these no borders, say from here you drive across to France, but then, you know, things still change. Um, so, so there is still a border for, 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 for many points of view. 
Um, and then, of course, and I'm going to very quickly talk about uh, COVID-19 later, um, but, uh, you know, there are, there are no formal borders, but of course, when we look at COVID-19 measures in the way that uh, member states have enacted them, they were all about borders. So the experience was all of a sudden very much again um, uh, about these borders. And of course, one of the big problems these days uh, is, you know, what to do with all these people that work in a different uh, member state on a daily basis and have to cross these borders that are now being um, um, reenacted again and uh, where you have to, to require permission to, to get across. And finally, on the experience of orders, of governmental orders, um, again, you have a number of examples where these experiences are characterized by what one might see as these tensions and inconsistencies, but as I would argue, are connected to a deep um, ambiguity at the heart of European integration. Uh, you've got a single market uh, with rules that uh, that govern uh, the production of products uh, and the quality of standards of products in in very minute ways, and at the same time you've got uh, a whole diversity of social policy, so-called best practices. So you've got sort of a re resort to rather intergovernmental slash governmental standard setting rather than. Uh, you know, uh, coherent rules. And anyone who, like me, has actually moved across Europe will, will know how difficult this is actually, even though in, in theory um, you should have the, the freedom of movement and things should be so easy. Um, you've got joint policies in many areas uh, that also incur cost, etc. Uh, but you have no shared debt mechanism. And you will perhaps have heard about uh, the idea that, uh, or the policy that now, you know, there should be a COVID fund uh, where EU member states collectively um, are uh, trying to raise money on the market and how there is now um, a constitutional court case in Germany, and this relates to the fourth point here, where the superiority of EU law is widely recognized and at the same time the superiority of national constitutional law uh, is also being, being uh, put forward. Um, and and uh, to, 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 to navigate that sort of um, tension is very, very difficult, actually. Um, and uh, I'm not even sure how I would predict the Constitutional Court to, to, to how, how they will resolve this um, in the end. Um, and, on, you know, in the same way, you have uh, the idea that uh, there are common values specified in the Treaty of the European Union. But then the, the laws are very different in many member states, including, for instance, gender. And everyone talks about Poland and, and Hungary. Uh, but, uh, you know, people say that, you know, one of the worst cases actually is Malta. Um, and, you know, that that, that is very often uh, uh, an obstacle in, in trying to find a, a unified European uh, policy. And this is all about the divisions within, where at the same time, you have a high degree of integration. Um, uh, you also, of course, have the, the, the opposite in uh, states that are non-member states and where through uh, problems of external governance, uh, there are, you've got to take a lot of uh, rules. The, the rule taking is very high and you've got to, so many EU rules apply, even though the, these are not uh, member states. And so you move within the EU, but there are, you face at the same time significant hurdles. Uh, you move outside the EU and you're still governed by aspects of the EU. And so I think these experiences of identities, borders and orders, um, many people are confounded by that. Um, and and uh, uh, often, you know, th this leads them to people saying, oh, this Europe doesn't work or, oh, you know, we need to do, become, we need to come to a federal system. We need to, to strengthen the state-like features of the EU, et cetera. And I want to argue that, that th th this is too naive um, and perhaps also that this is not warranted and, and ethically perhaps not uh, warranted. Uh, and that these, these, um, these tensions uh, in fact have to do with irreconcilable an irreconcilable ambiguity uh, at the heart of not only the European Union, but 
at the heart of international society, where the, the thing is always about balancing different parts, and therefore you can never get rid of the ambiguity. Uh, the question is rather how you strike this balance, and the balance is really between pluralism and uh, solidarism. And uh, this requires a very quick um, excursion into uh, international society thinking. Uh, some of you may know that I've um, over the last, well by now probably 20 years, also been uh, interested in the so-called English School of International Relations um, and its um, concept of international society and specifically how the European Union and European integration relates to this idea of international society. Um, so, so, so very quickly, for those of you who are not familiar with this, um, a, a sort of a two minute summary um, of the lecture on uh, the English school and international society. So first they were dealing with a society of states here. So the idea is that states form a society, but rather than only a system, states form a society. And they do so because they share I can read values, uh, they, they share uh, particular values and interests, um, and thus they partake in joint institutions. And of course the core interest and at the same time value they have, the core norm that they refer to is the norm of sovereignty. They're all interested in maintaining their sovereignty. Uh, and so the idea is that uh, the classic institutions of international society uh, basically are all there to guarantee the sovereignty um, of international of, of those individual members, the states uh, of international society, um, and uh, and that um, uh, they basically uh, regulate the behavior of states towards each other largely through the norm of non-intervention. Uh, if you will, this is a very rudimentary idea of what such a society could look like. So those institutions that they partake in um, can either be broad patterns of practice, so something that states routinely return to in order to manage their relations and in order to maintain order. And in the line below, you can see the five main institutions once suggested by Hedley Boo, um, international law, diplomacy, I mean, all of these things make intuitive sense. He even thinks the balance of power is such an institution because he argues that this is not something that happens sort of automatically in a system, but it is something that states routinely return to, to maintain a sort of, you know, this, this, this sovereignty and, and uh, the norm of uh, non-interference, because if there was no balance of power, there would be one universal power, a unipole, that it could impose its will on all these others. So that's why states turn to the balance of power. Um, uh, he even thinks that war is an institution. And of course, if we think about, say, interventions in, in the name of, say, human rights these days, um, and the responsibility to protect, etc., you can see how war could possibly be an institution right, that states turn to in order to rectify uh, gross violations of, uh, of, of international law or, or that, that threaten the international order. So these are sort of these patterns of practices, practices that states routinely return to. And formal organizations then, secondly, uh, these are the organizations, the institutions that we would normally associate with international institutions, uh, such as the United Nations and it, its various sub-organizations, the EU, etc. Um, identities in that uh, context are state identities. Uh, they are, there are state borders. The societal orders are confined to states. The governmental orders are confined uh, to states. But those states in themselves form as it were a second order society, if you will, above those societies within the states. I mentioned this again because this is um, uh, distinct from a conception of world society where we would talk about individuals, um, where we would talk about claims like human rights, etc., where the states are not the units that form the society, but individuals form that society. And so one of the big questions, and here I now return to my ambiguities after this uh, small excursion, one of the main questions that has confounded uh, analysts within that tradition for a long time is how to integrate claims of world society 
claims of the rights of individuals into the broader set of, uh, uh, of, of rules and norms of international society as a society of states. And human rights is the classic example that uh, is often referred to. The classic sort of the classic solution of the human rights problem was to actually make states responsible for uh, human rights. Um, and you can see this in the United Nations system. Right? There is no court system that would be able to, um, to somehow objectively and then um, uh, uh, with full power and force enact a human rights system. At the end of the day, uh, it is a matter of the states that have to actually uh, bring human rights uh, to, um, to their, their to the deserved uh, life. Um, and of course, this is, this is bizarre because uh, uh, on the other hand, of course, we know, historically speaking, that human rights were directed against states. So, so this is a particular sort of to attempt to balance those two claims of world society and an international society, but it's a radical one because it's very much towards the pole of the state. So you regulate world society claims more or less only through the states. And of course, what we've seen in the 20 years after the end of the Cold War in what I would now call a liberal moment of, um, of uh, uh, world order uh, is that, that this has shifted more uh, to if you want to say oh, the world society angle, huh? a very limited way, huh? but a little bit more uh, to the world society angle in the sense that through say the International Criminal Court, through the responsibility to protect, etc. Um, there's been sort of this, this, this very little minor shift huh? um, and, 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 uh, and, 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 and try and rebalance that those claims of world society with the claims of um, the, the states. And what I wanna, so, so and, and this sort of is, this, this debate is normally um, in those, in this literature referred to as the debate between pluralism and solidarism. Uh, and, and I think these terms are important because these terms reflect already the ethical claims that are behind it. Because many of us, uh, many of, at least at least ten years ago, still I would say many of us would have said, "So to hell with those states. Uh, we want uh, we want a cosmopolitan uh, order." Uh, but the problem with the cosmopolitan order has always been how to actually balance this against difference, uh, and how to make difference known in that order. And you can imagine that pluralism, solidarism debate in those very terms. So pluralism in, a, in, a, in an order that is largely based on states and organized through states, where with clear-cut borders, clear-cut identities and governmental orders confined to states, that is an order that gives preference and priority to um, pluralism to the diversity um, that is out there. And it wants to sort of protect that. Uh, but it does so, of course, in problematic ways because it links it very much to territory. Yeah? But the argument is then we don't have another good way of doing this because once we get rid of territory, there's always the risk of an superimposed universalism. And so we get to this, uh, this tension between the claims then that we hold to be um, uh, the, the universal uh, rights claims um, uh, versus the, the need to protect diversity. And this is sort of mirrored in this debate between pluralism and solidarism, where solidarism is the idea that those states have responsibilities not only towards themselves, but need to integrate those world societal claims. Um, and of course, once you go that way, you automat and I, my suggestion is we want to go that way. We want to go into a solidarist way because an order that is only based on territorial states is untenable. It cannot be justified because clearly there are claims out there that we need to take care of. We need, there are people out there who, who die. There are people out there whose human rights are, um, uh, whose are violated. There are people, I mean, you know, 
there are governments out there, um, if I may say so, uh, that withdraw from conventions that were signed in their own country with the universalist claims. Um, clearly, we ought not to be happy about that. Um, but at the same time, of course, you know, the, 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 we, we, we also probably um, uh, ought to take account of the fact that we do not want a world government, etc. So in a sense, it's clear we want to we move into a solidarist direction. But at the same time, it's also clear that the solidarist direction inherently brings with it unresolvable ambiguities because we've got two uh, rights claims, so to speak, two claims of justice uh, that always, that can only be balanced. They cannot be uh, resolved as it were. European integration, I suggest, is one way of solidarizing in an extreme way, if you will. So it goes much further than any effort that we would normally see, but still it would, it's not able to resolve those principal ambiguities at the heart of the international society and the problem of how to organize both difference and uh, universality. So European integration, I suggest, was to overcome the state fixation of the international order. It was in its most radical form, it was what um, international society scholars would call revolutionary in the sense that it would even want to replace states as the main uh, constituent units of international society. But I think in practice, it was rather solidarizing, as I just suggested. Uh, and here's a table that uh, I, I once put together with Ian Manners and Richard Whitman, in which we argued that those five institutions, as we know them from Hedley Bull, have been in the course of European integration fundamentally transformed. Instead of the balanced power, we have the pooling of sovereignty. Instead of international law, we have a new type of law system, the Akika Monotaire. Instead of diplomacy, we have a kind of multi-managerialism. Instead of war, we have a sort of Pacific de democracy. Instead of great power management, or concert as we called it there, uh, we, we've got a multi-perspectivity within the EU and different member states coalitions. And I think we were very optimistic there. Um, and I think what we disregarded, like many others, is the true ambiguity that is underpinning this. So I think that, you know, the pooling of sovereignty is indeed right, but at the same time, of course, this means that states are still there, and so there is still this inherent tension that this uh, creates. So I would say that this then, so, so th in, this, in the liberal moment of the post-Cold War world, uh, everyone got very excited huh, in the sense that this is a new world order, etc. And I think what we've experienced since is that the, the, the ambiguity is, is, is still there and we haven't been able to overcome this. That the territorial order of modern politics is more profound, that we find it very difficult to imagine orders that are not based on territorial borders that the narratives of national identity or quasi-national identity, if we talk about a European identity, are difficult to change because they provide in the eyes of so many a simplified meaning and that is coming back now uh, in the populist uh, revival. We see lots of people turning again uh, to the simplified meaning in a world that they regard too complex because they're not used to think in ambiguities and therefore every time there is this tension they think this is a major problem. Um, internally, the EU in a sense uh, is a very strong solidarist layer, the, the, the change of institutions that Ian Richard and I tried to describe in our 2011 article, but in a sense it's a layer over a still pluralist society of states. Externally, the EU is a, an actor that pushes solidarization on a global level, but essentially it, it does so in a still pluralist society uh, and therefore it runs continuously into ambiguities. One would even argue that in a sense that the EU itself in engaging with that pluralist international society is itself becoming much more pluralist than perhaps it used to be in those days where this engagement was far away and was not at the, at the forefront. So th this ambiguity, I would argue, and I've argued, is inescapable. 
because there are these structural issues of two competing claims that uh, we cannot sort of in decide on one side. And that experiencing Europe today is caught up in these ambiguities. And perhaps uh, since the early 1990s, um, with EU enlargement um, and with first the liberal moment and then now the revival of autocracies and, and the rise of populism, etc., these ambiguities have become more visible in our experiences. Now, let me, let me end on um, uh, this question of reimaginations and, and the struggles that have to take place in this particular context. So I would argue that we need to take seriously and we need to probably accept that we cannot get out of this ambiguity without imposing a universalism that is probably only our own universalism on everyone else. Um, or on the other hand, um, turning to um, nation states and pursuing a nationalist policy. So if we, assuming that neither of these paths uh, is uh, acceptable, um, we cannot resolve this ambiguity. So I think it's better to accept that and be, be clear about this. But this doesn't mean complacency. Um, it seems to me that um, I, I use a quote here from a project of all of Eva ones that you know, there are different types of Europe's and therefore there is a struggle for Europe and for what Europe means. I think that, that is ongoing. Um, and, I, and I think that th therefore, um, th th that we should still engage in that struggle and accepting the ambiguity does not mean to stand still, um, but that we might still push uh, European integration forward um, in terms of a solidarist Europe, uh, accepting though that we will not achieve a cosmopolitan uh, Europe as, as some have actually called this. Um, so, so I think we need a, a realization that the experience of inconsistencies may actually come from a denial, from our own denial of uh, the ambiguities, that, that we experience these things as inconsistencies because we cannot think huh, of, of um, there used to be an old nice phrase of doing this as from an either or to an and thinking. Um, so, so this we we have difficulties huh, to, to 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 come from the clear lines of either or to to end, and that that would mean that we need to reimagine what identities, borders, and orders mean. Um, and now you're all sitting there thinking, okay, let's uh, what are these reimaginations? And the answer is, of course, that I st I'm still you know trying to figure out what one could possibly sort of do, and I want to just give you some pointers that. Uh, that uh, you know, I found in the course of my career. Um, uh, at the same time, you know, you know, myself having been often become much more frustrated in where these alternatives are and how we could enable them. Um, uh, frustrated in the course of politics, etc. Um, let me just to test four things, um, and there are some you know are actually where I say you know we've got these policies, we've got need to think about them differently and make them into something else. The first one is that I think in terms of the way we engage as, a, as critics uh, with, of politics, as analysts, as critical analysts of politics, the way we engage with uh, European integration in this particular context always has to involve a double move. It is always um, an argument against othering um, against uh, sort of the putting sort of nation states and, and national grandeur or whatever at the heart, um, against articulations of unambiguous national identities, or for that matter also European identities. So we need to, to do this on both sides huh? and not, uh, we tend to sort of fall back in a naive um, uh, EU federalism at the same time um, others fall back into naive nationalism. Uh, and I think a first step, I think, would be to be critical of both moves um, rather than um, only one. The second one is in my very early part of my career, I've been interested in these alternative visions of Europe. And I think there are um, uh, visions of Europe that we need to perhaps um, bear in mind not so much, and I, at the time already, I thought that they're not proposing a blueprint 
for um, a, a European Union, but they rather provide us with a different ethos, with the way we approach the idea of European integration. And I take two um, examples here. One is that uh, in the 1980s, the big buzzword was subsidiarity. Now, many people don't like that uh, because it's not uh, a principle that can be turned into a legal framework, etc. Uh, you know, I'm Catholic, so I, I, I like that term because it comes out of uh, Catholic uh, social teaching. Uh, and I think it's a very, very uh, good principle. It's about, you know, the fact that what you can do on a lower level should not be uh, done on a higher level. Uh, and I, I fully accept that there are lots of things that we need to, you know, you know where we need to have a framework on the European level. But I think, for instance, in the current COVID crisis, you do sometimes wonder whether it's not possible to do things better on a, on a, on a local level. Um, uh, and, and so I think for European integration, the idea that one would do this uh, it, from the spirit of subsidiarity is perhaps a good one. Um, and I don't mean that the nation states should remain the ones who actually do the policies, because that is how subsidiarity uh, subsidiarity ultimately was interpreted when it uh, entered the EU treaty. It was interpreted as a division between states and the EU, but I think it's a much more radical um, ethos than, than you know, allocating responsibilities between two levels. And the other example is the ideas of integral federalists. When you go back to the debate after the end of the Second World War about what federalism is, you found that the, the, the European Federalist movement had heated discussions in their proceedings about what form uh, federalism should take. And there was a strong group of what I call here integral federalists, um, a strong group of people who argued against thinking of this uh, purely as a federal state who argued that this must be more, this must be a social movement, that federalism means constant renewal, and that it is what very much tied to what I understand here to be the principle of subsidiarity, so that we need to strengthen uh, lower units, lower, quote unquote, both in terms of local territories, municipalities, etc., and functional groups. Uh, this was the day when functional groups was something that people very much liked. Now, there's a reason why they lost the debate, uh, because many of them were then seen as dreamers. And uh, to be honest with you, some of them also were outright racist uh, because uh, their, their concern with uh, strengthening the local was to protect sort of the, the cultures from, uh, you know, the, the whatever, Middle Ages or something, or what they imagined the Middle Ages to be. But I'm always of the view that uh, just because some people are um, uh, uh, politically, um, uh, how shall I put this, idiots, huh? the, 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 that doesn't mean that all of their uh, conceptions are completely wrong. Anyway, um, uh, so they lost the debate, and now we think of federalism in those statist terms, and I think it would be good uh, to you know, constantly bear in mind that federalism may mean more uh, than this. Thirdly, um, I want to point to uh, something that has received a lot of criticism, um, but I'm partly sort of, uh, of course, I have, an, I have stakes here because a good friend of mine actually came up with this. Um, uh, and so I want to defend her a little bit, um, uh, but also because I think that those criticisms are short-sighted and fall back into this either or thinking and doesn't think in terms of ambiguities. So when you read the global strategy of the European Union, and when you look at the debates about the global strategy, you will see that one of the core terms there is the idea of principled pragmatism. And of course, a whole range of colleagues has really destroyed this idea of principled uh, pragmatism as a fallback into uh, sort of realist uh, imaginations of the EU. And, you know, and then of course, um, uh, von der Leyen comes and talks about the geopolitical commission, etc. Um, and, I, and I think that's a bit, you know, my, my view is that this is a bit short-sighted, that in the critique of this, people fall back into uh, their old sort of boxes, 
rather than doing what they should do, namely take this as an opportunity to think about the world in more ambiguous terms uh, and to, to embrace this and, and be clear that, you know, previously they've criticized the idea of normative power, rightly so, because uh, was, uh, in the way that this was often put into political practice is that the EU people went out and, you know, were teaching others how to behave. Um, uh, and, and, you know, that that was perhaps uh, not the way to go about this. Um, and, and, you know, then, of course, there is a sort of reformulation and an answer to this in the form of principal pragmatism. And, you know, instead of taking up this idea that, you know, the, this tension within this, within pragmatism and principles and think about what this means and, you know, engage in a debate and, 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 and try and, and think about how to enact this in, in ways that would lead to a more solidarist world without always, you know, being the Eurocentrist mission uh, person, um, you know, they, they, they read only pragmatism and they equate it to realism and so on. So, so my suggestion from, from my talk today is to perhaps uh, show a little bit more imagination um, uh, and, and engage with this um, uh, in, 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 in different ways. And finally, I also think that when you look at uh, EU policy over the last uh, decades, for instance, if we look as I have done empirically, uh, perhaps more consistently than, 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 than other stuff, uh, if you look at the EU's engagement in uh, the climate regime, you will see that the EU was on a mission, uh, um, um, on, on a mission for, for a long time. Um, and it, you know, after the, the failure of the, of the Copenhagen summit uh, in 2009, then, you know, it, it had to change. And what they've done is partly, I think, um, quite good. I mean, I don't think that in, at the end of the day, in terms of climate change, the Paris Agreement is uh, the, the ideal outcome. But in terms of how the EU engaged in diplomacy, and particular in what they call the Green Demo Dip Diplomatic Diplomacy Network, um, I think the EU started to engage in, in ways that we in our project would have called uh, ways of mutual recognition. Um, not going out and telling, okay, we know what needs to be done, but engaging with a plurality of actors and, and listening to them and trying to find ways forward in this more dialogical way. So what I'm saying is, firstly, as a consequence of what of taking ambiguity seriously and thinking about this balance. In our critique, the double move is, I think, important. In terms of visions, we might return to some of the old stuff that wouldn't give us a blueprint of where this goes to, but perhaps would act as a kind of balance to some of the policies that are going on. And then I see some indications or some elements of current EU policy practice that could lead to uh, reimaginations. And so similarly, if you can play this, you know, I, I felt I need to say something about the periphery. You know? um, uh, so so you, can, you can look at, you know, the struggles in the periphery. And, and, you know, again, so there, this double move would be to take a stance against EU double standards, and you know the Orientalism that is often underpinning EU policy, and at the same time critique you know the articulation of exclusionary identities, neo imperialism. I have a specific country in mind that I know something about. Um, so so I think you know you can. The, the point is that the, just because you critique one, you don't have to be sort of the friend of the other, and it's these dichotomies that I think completely uh, go against uh, what I was what I have been saying. Um, I think it's important to engage in the continued transborder activities and being alert to reproduction uh, of borders as they often exist in EU policy. Well, that's a simple point, uh, really. Uh, be more explicit about ambiguity and your own position towards it. Don't pretend that you've got the, the, the solution one way or the other. It's a very side remark, something that I miss in politics these days a bit more honesty uh, about things. Um, and realize that, so this returns me a little bit to, to Cyprus. I've written a paper that is coming out in, a, in an edited volume uh, in a couple of weeks where my Cypriot friends will kill me for that. Um, uh, but you know, recognition integration may work hand in hand. Uh, we, we need to think about this in those ambiguous terms. It is perhaps through, and you know, this is the experience of um, integration from 
uh, its immediate start, that, you know, that we recognize each other and through that we achieve integration. These are not opposites if they are done uh, correctly. You know? So this is just uh, turning back to my initial uh, outset of, of, of Cyprus. Um, and, and I did say that I wanted to say a little bit uh, something quickly about COVID and I think again you know here and this is a very as it is a very random thoughts really about this but but it seems to me that you know in this discussion about you know the the failure of the commission to order enough vaccines I mean I don't know maybe this is only a German discussion uh, but I find that you know there's all this thing about oh okay Israel has already um, vaccinated uh, all of their but I think you know perhaps we need to bear in mind that there are different uh, principles that, that, the, that the Commission had to deal with. Uh, and of course we can all come later and say we should have just wasted all the money and thrown it into the throats of the pharmaceutical industry um, and, and hired at a high price. Yeah? Um, I wonder what would have happened if they'd done this then in five years people say well, why did you pay all that all that money you know I mean I think this is a I think a bit more you know be a bit more considerate in sort of that we need a unified EU policy but at the same time we need to take care of the divergence of uh, different views uh, I think seems to me to be to be um, uh, important here. Um, go away from these unilateral border closures that we constantly see towards a more differentiated management where um, you know you have us they had in between they started to do sort of the the, the what's it called those uh, those figures by by district huh, across Europe and I wonder where all this went huh? we're back to thinking about this in purely national terms um, uh, and, and I think you know uh, uh, the, the COVID fund is very much a welcome thing and I hope that the, the, the German uh, court will, will not uh, uh, stop this uh, and will realize that we can engage in such a fund and not, you know, give up sovereignty altogether. So anyway, I've tried to argue that the experiences of European integration are full of tensions on different scales and in different spheres, that this relates in particular to the experience and articulation of identities, borders and orders, and that the root of this lies an irresolvable ambiguity of pluralism and solidarism in international society, that we need to learn to think and act within this ambiguity. And I suggested that this requires a double move and critique. Uh, and we can summarize the other things as an ethos of mutual recognition and that this may lead to reimaginations of identity borders and orders. And uh, this is the advertisement break. Um, this is some of the stuff that uh, people always quote my old stuff, you know, I want to promote here some of the more recent stuff that, uh, that uh, I've uh, put into this particular lecture. Thank you. Uh, and I don't know how to proceed now. I presume uh, there are many people who have questions and who may uh, ask me, what the hell did he mean when he was saying that? <laughs> Okay, thank you, Professor Diaz. Thank you for this wonderful lecture. And now uh, we have kind of 10, maximum 15, or I will be more correct if I said 12 minutes, 10, 12 minutes for uh, discussions, questions, comments. So um, please um, feel free to ask the questions or uh, comment on, on the lecture. Uh, but give me any sign. I mean, raise your hand or I should say that uh, I that I suggested to Anna to do this for half an hour and then she said 45 minutes was more appropriate and I did say to her that this is you say never to an academic that he can speak for longer because then 45 minutes always turn out to become uh, more than an hour I do apologize no, it's okay. uh, Mr. David has a question he raised a hand mm -hmm. may I go yes sure Okay, first of all, Professor Diaz, many thanks for a very interesting uh, and uh, thought-provoking uh, uh, lecture, intervention. Um, I have a couple of questions, but I will uh, spare the time and we are limited in this regard. Um, two issues, maybe. We were talking about the identities 
um, and, and the building of the, our rethinking of identities, but somehow I was thinking of the, this top-down approach. And uh, but I somehow missed the bottom-up kind of uh, perspective of the whole thing, because we how how we see now the, how we regard. I mean, you were also referring to the international society, which is mostly constructed by the states, right? I mean, this is the internet, the, the meaning of this English school. Uh, how do you think, how, how ordinary cities, where the place of ordinary cities in the whole construction? Um, and in this regard, how do you see um, the, uh, let's say, uh, connection, interrelation between Europeanists and UEanists? I mean, being part of Europe, but at the same, or not being part of the Europe. And we all the time talk about the Norway, Switzerland, but we have countries like Kosovo, Balkan states, we have perspective, prospective members, or um, like Georgia, I mean, you showed out the map in the beginning, and the, we, I'm very glad that my map was including Georgia somehow, but we know other maps as well, where the Georgia is beyond Europe. So um, uh, if you can, just a little bit elaborate on this. So bottom up and um, well, Europe, Europe, you uh, interrelations. Are we collecting or? Um, uh, uh, shall we take more questions and? Yeah, I, 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 yeah. I think, yeah. If someone wants to ask something. Is, is anybody to? Patrick wants to. You're welcome. Well, I said let's take a couple of more questions and ask the questions. <laughs> yeah, I mean, thank you, Thomas. This was really a very, um, very stimulating talk. Thank you very much. And I remember those good old days when we were still mobile and able to travel to different parts of the world and speak about this stuff. Um, thank you. I mean, I don't, I'm not really a big fan of this Europe bashing, but I mean, there are so many scholars as well as practitioners and political actors who, uh, who call this ambiguity a crisis. So whatever you're calling an ambiguity is actually the crisis of the whole European project. I mean, how, I, don't, I know that you're not buying this, but how would you link this framework that you've, sub, uh, uh, that you've uh, presented to us to those debates on the crisis of Europe. I mean, especially within the con context of Brexit, the migration crisis. So, how would you make how how shall we make sense of this um, ambiguity in terms of this Europe is suffering from eternal crisis? Okay, I, I think I'll start now. I was hoping for an easy question so that I could think longer about David's question, but then Basha comes with this one. So I think I'm just going, there was also a question in the chat. Um, uh, first of all, to the uh, bottom up. Um, I, I think personally, I, I admire people and I and endorse people who uh, uh, are looking into practices of identity um, from a, a bottom-up perspective in the daily lives of citizens in their various contexts. Um, but I'm afraid that um, when we talk about political identities, uh, that the ordinary citizen is very much um, uh, in, its, in its own, uh, in their own, expressions and constructions of identity very much socialized into uh, uh, the either or thinking that I have um, uh, outlined in particular uh, in the national imagination. Um, and uh, I think this is a problem. Um, and I think it is worthwhile looking for alternative expressions of identity. I, you know, I encourage everyone to do that. But we should not fool ourselves and think that uh, that, that is the, the way that that that, uh, that citizens generally think. And I think, in particular, in moments of crisis, Bashak, um, uh, I the return to those simple truths of um, of nationalism uh, is very easy and, and uh, is in, indeed uh, practiced. I mean. Uh, 
Uh, we know from Michael Billing the idea of banal nationalism, and this banal nationalism has become so ingrained, therefore banal, in our daily lives. It is extremely difficult to uh, start um, uh, reimaginations of such political spaces. Um, so that's where I would put, uh, so I'm not sure therefore whether a bottom-up perspective would be that different. Um, um, uh, I think you've got to look at the trans-border communities no, for where this is a lot more vivid, of course. And I think that's a place to start. Uh, look at the experience of those people who currently all of a sudden now cannot cross the border anymore because COVID policies have um, uh, stopped them, or stopped them from doing so. And the way that, 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 that identities may, be, may have been changed there. But I think we've got a, a, a considerable problem at the moment in terms of you know, conflict transformation uh, and uh, transformation to a different type of society in sort of bringing those experiences um, uh, um, into the broader public. No? Um, because, because, and I think we've got to start there somewhere else. We've probably got to start with rewriting textbooks, it's history textbooks, not only um, in Cyprus, but, but actually everywhere. Yeah? Um, I mean, you know, if, I mean, you would consider, sorry, I'll stop there in a moment, but you would consider German, Germany um, a reasonably, you know, after the Second World War, a reasonably post whatever national, whatever you want to call it, uh, community. Well, look at the text, the history textbooks that my son uh, has to deal with, and you would see how German-centric these textbooks are. Um, uh, and it's still the narration of the German nation. Uh, and yes, there's a whole, you know, the, the, there's, there's a, a lot of stuff about uh, the Second World War and, and then Nazi and so on. But of course, you know, uh, look at the way that they talk about the Middle Ages. It's still about, you know, the, and anyway, you get my drift. So I think that that's to, to, the, to the ordinary citizen's experience. My answer would be the ordinary citizen's experience is actually very much uh, 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 structured by uh, the, 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 the top down, um, as you called it. I can't say a lot about the, uh, the um, uh, okay, it, when we go to Kosovo and Georgia, etc., my sense is that uh, Europe is very much an instrument for domestic politics. And that different uh, views, that it is a sort of associated, so ex expressing your uh, allegiance or not with Europe is very much tied to particular positions internally. And I've, I've always been very skeptical and my Georgian friends may forgive me, I love your country, etc. But the politics that sometimes has been done uh, with putting EU flags behind uh, uh, Georgian politicians, etc. Uh, I find always a bit um, irritating, to be honest. Um, uh, and, I, and I'm wondering, um, so, so I think I think there's a lot there's a lot of things going on here of constructions of Europe that have to do with constructions of a particular also you know internal conflict identity, uh, which I find uh, uh, problematic. Um, I think therefore um, there is a vague sort of resemblance with equating the well, there's a vague uh, um, what I want to say there's there's a there's a vague way in which the EU and and Europe are, are considered the same. And where this in turn is used as a as a as a as a political reference point, that is slightly different, but only slightly so uh, in Norway and Switzerland, where this is also a lot about symbolic politics. Um, um, but I think Norwegians would very clearly think of themselves as being part of Europe, um, uh, but not part. Some of them think of not part of the EU. But maybe we can discuss this further in another context. There was a question in the chat about the ENP and the EU as a global actor. I'm not entirely sure how um, this uh, question was meant, uh, but clearly the neighborhood policy is one of the policies where uh, the, the European understanding or the EU understanding of its relations with uh, global politics should come into, into um, uh, full being. Um, and uh, I would say that over the years here, there has been also a return by many actors of an either or thinking. Um, and uh, that perhaps um, 
we need to to to, to no, and I, I think this is an, a laboratorium as it were no? so if the eu uh, can't get this right um, i think it would be difficult to think of the eu as an effective global actor this wasn't a very good answer forget about it but maybe you can specify the question in more concrete terms um, uh, later on uh, and finally uh, bashak i think that those crises or what people perceive as crises partly stem from the illusion that people have that we could st we still live in a world of these very clear boundaries etc and that people are fail to 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 be to be able to think in terms of ambiguities uh, if we think about uh, brexit um, you know i mean i think that on the one side, people made too much about Brexit because they were thinking that uh, Brexit means the end of Europe, etc. And it doesn't. It does mean that a lot of governmental structures are no longer there. It does mean that uh, there are certain uh, people who may benefit and others who may uh, suffer from this. It does mean that a lot of things get a lot more complicated. Um, and I would have wished they wouldn't have done it, but it's not the end of the world either. Um, on the other hand, it's not the solution to all the problems of the United Kingdom uh, either. No? So the Brexit crisis in that sense uh, is, um, I'm not sure it is the crisis that, 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 that many uh, uh, have drawn on. Um, I'm more skeptical about, and I think this is more, this is more difficult for me, um, is the current crisis we see around the rule of law and uh, Hungary and Poland. Um, and this is because here my own talk of today of recognizing ambiguities is being pushed to the extreme because how do you deal with, uh, say, um, governments that you know, clearly violate uh, things you hold very dear. And I think here the principle of uh, critiquing uh, is very important. Um, a long time ago, um, uh, I, people will not remember this, perhaps you weren't even born then. Uh, uh, the, the, in, the, in the late 1990s, uh, the, the Austrian FPÖ, so the so-called Liberal Party, which of course was, we would call them populists probably nowadays, and the structure around this guy called Jörg Haider. They became part of the government in Austria, and you will recall that, oh, if you do remember this, that the, the other European heads of governments were actually deciding that they would boycott uh, Austria. So they had meetings without Austria, and they had, uh, there was a group photo uh, in which uh, the Austrians were missing, etc. And, and I was always, I found this, I found this problematic. And I, and I, I think, I think they, they were, they were uh, unacceptable, um, you know, people, some, some of my friends would call them simply fascist <laughs> folks. Yeah? So it's a, I have no sympathy whatsoever uh, for the uh, FPÖ. But at the same time, I also thought, and this is where my double move comes in, um, I thought the way that the other states reacted to the FPÖ is uh, basically whitewashing their own problems, as if these problems hadn't existed in the other states either. Um, and so I think rather than coming to a, sort of uh, a broader dialogue about um, uh, xenophobia in those days um, uh, in our societies, um, one, you know, the one side uh, played the bad guy and was very happy to play the bad guy, and the others were very happy to brand, and, uh, to, to brand this guy the bad guy, uh, which I think politically uh, is perhaps not uh, the best way to, to deal with this. Um, and so I would say a stronger response uh, to um, uh, Hungary and Poland um, would be in, in order. Um, but at the same time, this should not come, you know, with um, uh, as if uh, pretending as if, as it is often the case, as if those problems uh, with rule of law do not exist in other countries. Um, I, I think that is, that, that would, so, but this is more of a crisis, yeah, that, that many of the other crises 
that we talk about. And if journalists ring you and say, oh, you know, do you think the European Union is dead now? And, you know, I say, I don't think so. Let's meet again in 40 years. And I think I've, I will win that bet. There's a lot of uh, okay. things in the chat now. And I, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm single-minded, simple-minded, so I cannot uh, talk. And unfortunately, the unfortunately, we are running out of time. So I'm afraid that we won't be able to continue this discussion. Uh, so um, once again, I, I would like to uh, 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 express my sincere gratitude towards you, Professor Diaz, for your kind contribution to our uh, workshop. Uh, and uh, now we should follow to our panel discussions. The links to, to the each session are put in the chat. Uh, and let's, let's take just five minutes. I think the five minutes will be enough to, uh, to go to, to uh, the links for the panel discussions. Uh, before we Asha, move, uh, uh, may I remind one very unambiguous thing about EU <laughs> regulations that I need your, we need your consent uh, for this uh, program, uh, well, as well as you, Thomas, <laughs> because this has been recorded and it will be uploaded to our LEAP uh, project website. So uh, if you're not giving your consent, please uh, let us know so that, I don't know what we will do then, but at least we will know that you don't show your consent. But <laughs> so we're still bound by EU regulations apart from all ambiguities. Yes. Thank you very much. And once again, Thomas, thank you very much for this uh, great and stimulating talk. And uh, I think we are moving to a different room now. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Thank you thank for you. Uh, keeping up with my thoughts here. Thank you. Thank you.